welcome your grace and thank you very much for your time today. Congratulations on your new book, Becoming Missionary Disciples. I'd just like to start off by asking you why you decided to write this book. Well, this book is really the, um, the result of a series of talks that I gave uh, in the Archdiocese last year. <clears throat> I call the, um, the series Evan the Evangelium series. The, even the word Evangelium is, of course, a word for gospel. And, um, and, and the main purpose of those talks last year was to engage with uh, Catholics across Tasmania and invite them to reflect on how they could be missionary disciples. And the phrase missionary disciples was a phrase that was used by um, Pope Francis when he produced his encyclical, which was really on evangelization, called Evangelii Gaudium. And so um, I thought it was a very useful uh, designation of how we as Catholics can perhaps change our self-understanding that in, in a way the Pope was saying, let's not just be disciples of Christ, let us actually be missionary disciples. So I thought that was a very good way of presenting, perhaps for, for many Catholics, a, a new and maybe challenging way of being Catholic, but to think of ourselves not only as following Christ, but knowing that we're also called to, to reach out to others and share our faith with others. And so the book was um, really the... Uh, the 15 talks that were given in that series and I just put them in, in book form. Do you think today that the church has actually lost its focus on mission and evangelization? I think historically the church has always been involved in mission. The church would not have reached every part of the, 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 the globe, every culture uh, and have a presence right across, right across the, the, the earth without there being a missionary thrust because that was the original uh, instruction that the Lord gave to his uh, apostles at the ascension, go out to all the world um, and proclaim the gospel. So we've done that for 2,000 years. I think it's also true to say that particularly in more recent centuries, the missionary focus of the church has been taken up by missionaries, by priests and religious. And we often think of um, people leaving their home countries like places in Europe, where the, where the faith is strongly established and going to mission lands like going to Africa or going to Asia or somewhere like that. And, and so I think there's been a tendency in the church in recent centuries to say the mission of the church is something that is the responsibility of priests and religious who maybe devote their whole lives to being missionaries. Uh, very clearly and particularly since the Second Vatican Council, um, the, the, the popes have have focused on the importance of mission as being the responsibility of all members of the church. If you're baptised, you're called to be a missionary. And, and so I think um, this thrust now is important because in the past, we often saw mission too as being a mission to a foreign country, whereas now I think missionary activity needs to be within our own culture, say here in Australia. So. Mission has always been integral to the life and mission and ministry of the church. But in more recent times, I, I think it's important to realise that now the missionary task of the church, I think really does fall on all the baptised. Now you've divided the book into three sections, which is heart and head and hands. Can you just explain for me why you've done it that way? Uh, yes, it was, when, when I was thinking about writing it, I was conscious that <clears throat> the beginning of being missionary is to firstly realize what has happened to us, our own encounter with Christ, the way that, that we have, through our faith in Christ, been transformed, been changed, been enriched in, in, in our life. And, and so the first part of the book was on really how Christ has, has touched our, ultimately our hearts, our, our inner being. Um, and I speak, I spoke in the, um, the book a lot about examples from the New Testament of people who had an encounter with Christ and how that changed them. And, and basically arguing all of us can recognise that if we have an encounter with Christ, a genuine encounter with Christ, he'll change us, we'll be changed, we'll be transformed. And so we need to begin with the heart. We need to begin with an understanding of what has happened to us in our inner being 
as a result of an encounter with Christ. Then the second part of the book was, was really a little bit of theory in a way, the head. So it was a little bit of theory. And so I took in that um, part of the, uh, the talks and, and that part of the book, uh, I took up something that um, Pope Francis spoke about in his letter to young people, Christus Vivut, in which he, um, he said that the, the, really there are four essential rules or laws to being Christian. God loves us. Christ saves us. Uh, Christ is alive. And we live our life through the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. So he spoke to young people about understanding, if you like, their identity, understanding what it means to be Christian on, on those four truths. Um, and I thought that was a very useful way of, of us understanding who we are as Catholics, understanding <clears throat> the foundations to our Catholic faith. So the second part was really an understanding, if you like, of our identity as Catholics. Then the third thing, hands, was all about how we can, in practice, be missionaries. So the last part of the book is more practical, and so I gave a number of illustrations of ways in which we can give expression to being missionaries. So the heart was the inner transformation, the head was an understanding of who we are, the hands was how we can, in fact, be missionary. Under the heart aspect, uh, you mentioned the importance of conversion, of people having that interior transformation. Um, can you just explain for me what does it actually mean to be converted to Christ? I, I think uh, <clears throat> when you look at stories uh, in the New Testament, I think they are the, probably the best place because here we get individuals who had a personal moment, a personal encounter with Christ. Now, it can take various forms, like somebody who, for instance, was healed. Um, not only were they to receive the healing power of Christ, but clearly that experience changed their, firstly, their understanding of God, God's love for them, God's mercy towards them, and the power of God to heal and, and save. Um, so all those encounters that we can see in the Gospels, encounters between Christ and people, you think of um, Zacchaeus climbing the tree and Jesus saying, I want to stay at your house today. And then he goes through a transformation. He says, I'm going to give away my money to the poor. I'm going to fix up anything that I've done that has been wrong. Um, so there's clearly a, a significant uh, change, conversion that takes place. I believe that anyone who has a genuine encounter with Christ will be changed, transformed by that experience. And I believe it's also the case in, in us as ordinary Catholics. We probably don't think about it enough. Now, maybe we don't have some powerful transformational experience like Paul on the road to Damascus. Maybe it's a, a, something that happens gradually over time. But all of us, I believe, if we look more deeply into the journey of our own faith, will recognise moments that have been significant in terms of some encounter with, with Christ, with Christ's love, with Christ's mercy, with Christ's forgiveness. Maybe it's uh, a, a prayer, a desperate need we've had that has been answered by God. We can all see that our lives have been changed by virtue of our relationship with Christ and, 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 and our lives have been transformed. We are now living differently because of the encounter with Christ. And, and I think for us as Catholics, we don't give that enough attention. And so the first part of the book was always uh, a, a means to encourage people to reflect upon their life, upon their experience, and to realise, yes, I have been changed by virtue of my faith in Christ, my experience of Christ. And what does it mean to be a disciple? Can you define a disciple for me? Of course, the word disciple was the fundamental term that was used in the New Testament to describe those who became followers of Christ, those who believed in Christ. And, and the word, I think, firstly means, I always like to use the image of someone who sits at the foot of a master. You know, the, the disciple is one who's prepared to listen, to learn from, to be inspired by and to imitate the master. It, it, for us, that's Christ. So a disciple, firstly, is one who wants to learn, who wants to listen, who wants to be attentive, 
A disciple is one who, who wants to spend time with the master, with Christ, so that they can benefit and be changed, inspired by their teaching and, and their example. In the book, you talk about the relationship between faith and healing, how it's so important to have that faith when you're asking for healing. And you also refer to um, an incident where you prayed over a married couple who were having trouble conceiving a child. Can you just relate that story for me and tell me what happened there? Yes, certainly. It, it was in a parish that I was in as a younger priest. And the parish was a, um, was a place that was a holiday place many people came there during the summer holidays in particular and um, and I can't remember what the gospel was but the gospel early probably in January of the year was a gospel which spoke about healing and I decided that I would preach about um, the gospel but at the end of mass I said uh, that I'd like to be available at the end of mass I didn't walk off the altar I said I'll stay on the altar and if anybody would like to seek prayer for healing um invite them to come forward and uh, so that day many people and, and, and not only parishioners but also visitors who were there uh, came forward. A year later, <clears throat> so the same time of the year, January, a year later I was celebrating uh, Sunday Mass and, and I, at the end of Mass I was standing outside talking to people and um, I could tell that there was a, a, a fellow just off to the side kind of waiting to talk to me you know and when I finished other conversations, he came over and he just said, look, uh, Father, I just wanted to introduce myself. He said, um, a year ago, we were here in your parish. Um, you you um, invited people to come forward for prayers for healing. Um, and so my wife and I decided to come forward for prayers for healing because we've been trying for many years to have a child and had not um, been able to conceive and the, the doctors were had a loss to know how to help us. So we were, you know, pretty desperate and felt um, we didn't see much possibility of having a child. And so we came forward for prayer. And then he just summoned his wife, who was also just on the side there, to come forward and said, just want to show you our three-month-old baby. You know, so that would have meant the child was conceived at the time of the, of the Mass uh, a year before. I found that very uh, wonderful, wonderful moment. And it's one of those moments that, that really confirmed me in the belief that if we approach Christ with our needs, perhaps our very deep personal needs, then our prayers can be heard and be answered. I, I think the important thing, though, is to ask. That's why Jesus said, ask and you shall receive. If you don't ask, so you've got to have a certain faith to ask. You've got to have a certain trust that your prayer won't be ignored or dismissed or, or amount to nothing. So if you've got that faith in your heart, that trust in God, um, and if you come forward with a certain humility, um, prayers, prayers are answered. Do you think that many Catholics today have lost that uh, belief in miracles that God can do the impossible? And how do we rediscover that belief? Look, I, I think we're living in a, an age where <clears throat> we do tend to think that we are responsible for everything, that, that um, you know, we, we, we're pretty advanced as a civilization. We've developed all these new technologies, and these new abilities. We've got medical sciences advanced a lot. And so there can be a tendency to feel everything now is, depends on us. Um, and sometimes people do look back and they, in more primitive um, times, people did turn to God because there was no other way of getting help. Now, I don't believe that's true. Um, and, and, and so I, I think when there are cases like I described of miracles, uh, when people do pray for something and the prayer is heard, it helps us understand that God is still present and active. And Christ's ministry wasn't only restricted to those years, really three years of his public ministry, but Christ's ministry continues now in and through the church uh, and in and through people of faith seeking uh, the healing power of Christ, seeking his help. I, I think why healing is important is not just the physical healing itself, but I think when a person experiences their prayers being heard, experiences experience some form of healing in their life, they realise firstly the utter reality of God, that God does exist. God is real. 
God is involved. God does deeply love me. God does show mercy towards me. So the effect of a miracle is, is really the deep effect it has upon us, upon our faith, upon our relationship with God. It opens us to allow God to be more present and active in our life. So, so healings aren't just about getting healed. They're about the transformation that takes place in us as a result of experiencing the love and mercy of God towards us. You also talk about the importance of personal testimony and you share your own testimony of how you first felt called to become a priest. Can you just uh, relate for me what happened there? What was that experience like? Sure. Um, I, I grew up in a, um, I think, just a typical Catholic family back in the, the 1950s. Um, I went to a Catholic school. Uh, we went to Mass on Sundays and... Um, I, I think I was just a normal Catholic boy at that, that time. Uh, in our school, we were encouraged, because um, we had a chapel at the school, and we were encouraged that when we came to school in the morning just to go in and say a little prayer, you know, and, and so I did that. Um, I think it was just a very simple prayer, just go in and kneel down for a few moments and say a prayer. And uh, the door was just near the altar rail, so you just come in, kneel at the altar rail, so look up at the tabernacle, say a little prayer, and off you go. Um, but one day, um, probably when I was about 12 years old, I went in um, as I normally did and just as I knelt at the altar rails, um, I just, not physically, but I, I had the thought came very clearly, very strikingly to me, one day you'll be a priest. Um, and that thought stayed with me throughout my um, secondary schooling. And uh, I just sensed that's what I should do with my life. And so I went to the seminary immediately after uh, I completed high school. For me, as I look back on it, uh, it really um, brings very clearly to mind the fact that God does call. God does reach out to us. God does engage. So we don't just live our lives finding our own way, but God will call. God will direct us, God will mark a path out for us. Now that doesn't have to be priesthood or religious life or becoming contemplative or missionary or something like that. It can, it can be just in the normal course of life that, that God has a plan and God does want to guide and lead us. So one of the things for me that's been always very important is that realisation that God does want to reveal his will for us his purpose for our life and inspire and direct us as to how we should live our life. What would you say to those who think that their own personal testimony is just not that interesting, that it's too boring to share with others? What can you say to encourage them? Yes, I, I think many people feel that. You know, a normal Catholic growing up and living the faith now probably thinks, well, I don't have a story. Uh, <clears throat> my life's been pretty ordinary, pretty average and nothing uh, spectacular. But I have a deep conviction that every person who is living their faith today, particularly in the environment now that we're in, in our society, that doesn't favour the, the living of faith, doesn't favour uh, having a strong relationship with God. I would say that every person who has a living faith today, if they look more deeply, will see the hand of God at work in their life. will see that there have been moments where God has touched their lives. There have been moments where God has revealed something to them. There'll be moments maybe of um, God answering prayers or assisting or guiding them in, in the way their, their life has unfolded. Uh, one of the things I do in the book is encourage people to reflect more deeply on their life, to look back. Um, now, it's not necessarily going to be some fantastic thing, but I think it's very good for us to look at our life and realise wow, God has been with me. God has walked with me. God has touched my life at these moments. I am the person I am today because of the grace and mercy of God at work in my life. And that's what you can share. Now, it doesn't have to be a, a great, powerful conversion story. It, it, sometimes it's just say, well, you know, you, you're talking to somebody and they're sharing something, say, and, and you think of, in your own life. When I was in that situation... I prayed about it and the situation was resolved or I felt um, helped and guided 
in how it is. So sometimes you can give a testimony from your own life that, that another person can identify with because they're in that same situation. They're struggling, they're uncertain, they're, uh, they've got some problem they're trying to deal with. And, and so really in the book, one of the main things I was trying to do is encourage people to realise God's presence and God's activity in their life and then to be willing to share that with others. You also encourage people to be um, invitational, to invite other people to come to Mass and to learn about the faith. Um, for many people, that's going to be quite scary and daunting. What could you say to encourage them to take that step? Well, I think it's true to say most Catholics would consider that really faith is a private matter. You know, I have my faith. I don't want to live my faith. And I love my faith, but um, <clears throat> I don't... Um, feel comfortable in, in, you know, wearing my hat in my sleeve or, or I, I don't feel comfortable in, in somehow uh, initiating things that talk about faith and so forth. Now, we've got to overcome that because firstly, Christ wants us, you know, don't put your light under a bushel basket, he says, you know, you've got to let your light shine. You've got to be prepared to, to, to share uh, with others, uh, you know, in appropriate ways and appropriate times. Um, so one of the main things I try to do in the book is encourage people to to just take little steps. I mean, one of the first things can be just to invite somebody to something, uh, uh, and and just to to take com ordinary conversations that can occur in life to see them as moments where we can invite a response from people in some way, um, encouraging them to, to, to do something. Look, this is happening in my parish. Why don't you come along? Or, or I'm going to attend this. I'd like to invite you to come along with me, things like that. So it's, it's, it's having that attitude of inviting. Not, uh, now, I know people can feel um, perhaps embarrassed or, or not confident that they could do it, I, I mentioned in the book, uh, I've had a number of occasions where <clears throat> people have, um, have decided to become Catholic. And in talking to them, I've realised they've been on the edges of the church or maybe even, even going to Mass regularly with their, their husband or their wife, um, but haven't taken the step. But for a long time, they were really embracing the faith and living the faith. And so I say to them, why did you leave it so long? And they say, well, nobody ever asked me. You know? So we often don't take the opportunity to invite people. And so people are on the edges really wanting to come closer to Christ, wanting to, to live the Catholic way of life. But nobody ever asked them. So part of what I do in the book is encourage, encourage people to have an attitude of inviting and to look for opportunities when the opportunities come. Don't pass them by, but invite people. Do you think that faith is more taught or caught? I think it's caught. I, I think faith is, in the end, a grace. It, in, in, faith is the result of a movement of God's Holy Spirit. Um, and so uh, what we are to be as missionary disciples is really agents of the action of the Holy Spirit. And in the end, we're not going to convert people. And it's not going to be even our arguments or, 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 or our <clears throat> ability to articulate the faith necessarily that will bring people to faith. It's rather that we are there to be instruments, means by which the Holy Spirit can move in people's lives. And, and I think if we have the idea that I, I could be a means by which the, the Holy Spirit can touch somebody's life, that's the important thing, uh, rather than feeling that all the responsibilities, I've got to get the words right, I've got to be able to put forth the right arguments, I've got to, I've got to be so holy or I've got to be so exceptional that people will, will really want to listen to me. No, no, I think we be ourselves but allow ourselves to be instruments of God's grace acting in and through us. So Your Grace, you, your book is basically like a blueprint for forming missionary disciples. Um, I'm just wondering why do you feel confident that this approach uh, will work in our culture today, which is very secular? I believe um, that the, the mission of the church in this time, 
is really going to be carried out by, by ordinary everyday Catholics rather than by great preachers. I mean, there's a role for great preachers. There's a role for extraordinary spiritual events taking place. All those things obviously have a place in the mission of the church and are often very important. But I believe these days that the way the faith will be um, transmitted, the way the faith will be promoted, if you like, uh, to other people will be through ordinary Catholics. Uh, and I think we've come to that moment where this is where I believe the grace of God will, will, will be active. So the book is really encouraging Catholics to see that they are the ones that God can use to, sh to enable other people to come to faith. I, I think it's very true when you look at the early church, we often think about people like St Paul, you know, great preachers and uh, extraordinary uh, people with extraordinary intelligence or eloquence and capable of, of preaching and, and have the, a force of personality to, to, um, to promote the faith. Now, as I said, there are a place for the great preachers, the great teachers, the great catechists. Um, but it's also true, and I think a lot of uh, studies that have been made in the early church have shown that the church really spread so rapidly in those early centuries because of the witness and the testimony of ordinary Catholics. People saw that these people had something and these people were willing to share what their faith meant to them. Now, a lot of them were converts and so they, if like, they knew what it was like not to have faith and then to have faith. But at the same time, I, I think it is... Uh, the witness of people who who just live their faith, who have allowed the grace of God to enrich and transform their life, I, I believe this is how the faith can be transmitted most effectively in our time. Given that we hear a lot today about the low rate of mass attendance and the low number of people actually practicing the faith, what keeps you hopeful about the church's mission moving forward? I think in the end one thing. Christ said, I'll never leave you. Christ is with us, will always be with us. He assured us that he'll watch over and protect the church, keep the church from falling into error, keep the church from being overwhelmed by the powers of darkness. <clears throat> There's a promise there that I believe has been fulfilled over the centuries and will continue to be fulfilled. And the, and the other thing that I think is very important is that the church began Pentecost through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Um, I often say that I think without the Holy Spirit coming upon the apostles at Pentecost, there would be no church. Even though they themselves had been with Christ and they'd heard Christ call them to now go out and be missionaries, I, I think in the end it was the coming of the Holy Spirit upon them at Pentecost that enabled that to happen. I believe the Holy Spirit is still an active presence and agent of the mission of the church and will continue to work in the hearts and lives of believers. Um, so Christ promises to watch over and protect the church and the presence and power of the Holy Spirit in the church, uh, I, I think will be always the means by which the church's mission is able to be carried out. Your Grace, what do you hope the impact of this book will be on those who pick it up and read it? Well, I'm hoping that if you like, uh, an ordinary Catholic who reads it thinks, yes, I have to become a missionary disciple. That this is, this is what it means for me to be a Catholic today, to be a missionary disciple. And then they might just try to be a missionary disciple. Thank you very much for your time today, Your Grace. It was a pleasure speaking with you and I wish you every success for your new book. Thank you very much. Thanks, Catherine. <laughs>